We're going to have a, uh, it, this is an informational meeting. It's not a board work session. It's not a board meeting. It's an informational meeting that that's, uh, we discussed to some extent uh, the necessity for doing this at the last board meeting that we had. And Ms. Peake uh, graciously agreed to do this, to come forward with the information and uh, <coughs> to provide that for us. And at this time, uh, Ms. Peake, if you would go ahead and, and proceed uh, with that. We've already had this morning a student hearing and some other things that happened, so some of us have been here a while, and <laughs> we want to, to get this thing started. We're going to start it, and we're going to move through it uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, there's a great deal of information in here, uh, and it centers around uh, what is taking place with the uh, Alabama Accountability uh, Act list that can act list that came out and also the state report cards that will come out tomorrow. I, I want to say that we have kicked off and you've been informed about Redefining Ready that says that our students are more than one test score and that that is the philosophy and what we see and what we believe in the Mobile County Public Schools. Transparency in education is of utmost importance where we report achievement, we report what uh, progress is being made in our schools, and also the success rate of our students, and we believe in that. We also know, though, that along with this, that the assessments used to report student progress must be aligned to state standards. Those state standards guide what the instructional program is in the classroom. So you want to assess what you teach. There's questions about that, about the Aspire, ACT Aspire that has been used, and I'll bring that up in a moment. Also, you also want a pattern of test scores that are reported over a period of time and what those scores look like and what that you're sustaining the use of that assessment. When Mobile County Public Schools uh, was involved with the Alabama mathematics, uh, reading mathematics test, the ARMED, over a period of time, progress was made. And when that test came to uh, a conclusion, uh, not, the schools in Mobile County were all clear. They were all scoring at the proficiency level. It took a period of time to do that, but indeed that was met. The criteria has to be clearly communicated and understood. And then also, when you're reporting uh, test information, the established grading practices need to be known. So with all of that being said, we want the transparency in education. We want everyone to understand what is taking place and what um, the state report card grade, also the accountability list is being based upon and how it came about. Just to give you a little chronological order, uh, the State Report Card Act of 2012 uh, called for a letter grade to be assigned to schools and school systems uh, based on the annual yearly assessment. Uh, and at that time, other criteria were included. Um, there was a, a state testing a committee, assessment committee that met over a period of two and a half years. And there was a, a, a form, a proposed report card that was developed. It took a lot of time and a lot of effort to look at that. And that's what the schools had seen uh, up until most recently. Uh, and that's what school districts were. Um, the one thing now, the state report card, uh, which will become a reality, the scores, uh, the systems have seen the scores, and the scores uh, will be made public tomorrow. Uh, the scores are based almost entirely on one test, the ACT Aspire. 90% uh, of the score on the elementary report card are uh, based on the ACT Aspire, with 10% being on uh, chronic absenteeism. And on the um, middle school 
and high school, 50% of the grades are based on uh, the Aspire test scores. Now, let me say grades three through eight were tested, and in high school, grade 10 was the test that the Aspire was administered on. Then the Alabama Accountability Act of 2013 was passed, and um, that's where uh, there was a flexibility bill incorporated <coughs> into uh, school choice that if schools were on the Alabama accountability list, the lower 6% in the state, that um, there was an option. School students and families could decide to go to another school within a school system, or there were tax credits for parents and scholarships for students um, that uh, were brought about by that in an effort to give uh, students choice. Again, this list is built based upon uh, this year the uh, ACT Aspire. So uh, I've covered some of this, but <coughs> to bring you up to where we are now, uh, at the end, and I said 90% uh, of our schools, our schools were all clear, uh, were scoring at 90% higher of proficiency on the armed. Uh, then uh, at that time, it was determined that the state of Alabama was ready to move to a test that uh, had higher standards, greater expectations. We supported that in Mobile County because we knew that we needed to continue to grow and to raise the achievement level. That was four years ago, and at that time, based on the best knowledge of, of all people involved, the ACT Aspire was selected to be that assessment. Four years later, from having experience with the ACT Aspire, which was a predetermined uh, factor or predicted a success on the ACT Aspire, a college entrance uh, uh, exam, uh, we know that that test wasn't as aligned as we should be. Uh, in 2000, January of 2017, uh, the, uh, the, the United States of a Department of Education notified then State Superintendent Michael Sentence that the Aspire was not, uh, was only partially aligned to the Alabama standards. Remember, I said what you teach and what students learn in the classroom is based on those standards. So a test that was only partially aligned. In June of 2017, the Alabama State School Board uh, acted upon that information and uh, what uh, the then superintendent was saying, and they unanimously voted to discontinue the use of the ACT Aspire. So at that time, the Aspire was completed, uh, and then the assessment was changed because you have to have an annual yearly assessment and you want an annual yearly assessment because you use that information to determine students' strengths, weaknesses, school program strengths and weaknesses, and what patterns of success are in a school system. So the test was then moved at that time to the Scantron test, uh, which is being administered district-wide. Scantron was used as a formative assessment in reading and mathematics to test uh, along periods of time in the school year Year to see how students were, had, were progressing. Mobile County had been used, using the STAR assessment in a much similar way. But now the Scantron is being administered where uh, it will be administered three times this year, a baseline from the fall. Right now the second administration is being completed in our schools. We'll be getting uh, scores from that and then at the end of the year, the Scantron in grades three through eight will be uh, reviewed and will be used with the ACT uh, then being used in grade 11, where all students in grade 11, and they have been taken and they will take the ACT again. So from this point on, the State Department is looking at and will make a determination on the next assessment that will be used in Alabama. Probably a two-year process, there is a task force in place to determine what those assessments will be. Now, 
When we talk about the ACT Aspire, and I've kept you informed through the reports that uh, I send you every Friday, that during the uh, uh, the administration, the 2017 administration of the ACT Aspire, there were some problems in Mobile County. Uh, we uh, had moved the majority of our schools test online. Uh, we had been doing that for several years. We had never had a technology problem uh, in, it, in, in giving the test. But um, when we administered the test this last spring, we had technology, technical problems. It was taking from one to seven minutes in some schools, in some test administration, for the test questions to roll up for the students to answer the next question. That's a problem because this is a timed test, and so you can imagine our teachers and students had worked very hard on school improvement plans, on you know, what they were doing every day in the classroom, the intervention programs, and as well as test preparation to have this, this problem. So we began communicating with ACT, saying, hey, we've got a technical problem. You'll be very proud of our IT department. They worked uh, continuously with ACT to address the problem. It was determined that it was uh, a uh, program glitch on the part of ACT, not with it feeding into the Mobile County Public Schools. And there were other systems in the state uh, that uh, had problems. I don't know the name or the, the number, but there were other systems that had the problem. So what this amounted to with the ACT Aspire was that 48 out of the 64 schools that tested online reported testing problems at one time or another uh, on the particularly the reading section of the ACT Aspire. Um, when you have a problem during testing, it could be a variety of problems, you report those problems as testing irregularities. In Mobile County, we, repro we reported 2,699 uh, test irregularities. Uh, the uh, vast majority of those all were that delay in the test questions rolling up. Um, so that issue was shared over a period of time, and I've kept you informed of that, from April the 6th until as late as December the 11th, with, with saying, uh, how has this impacted the reliability of the test scores that have come in to the Mobile County Public Schools? Um, so, um, you know, these are test results that we use, and we've known these test results since July. Uh, it's just the reports are coming out now. But we use these test results just like when you go to the doctor and you have a problem and there's tests given and you see uh, what the issue is, you address that problem. That's the same way that we use them in schools and you want those test results to be as accurate as possible. Um, so, uh, you know, that is a concern primarily of do we have good test information we're using in our classrooms to inform what we're doing with our students. We use other measures of progress too. Certainly the Scantron is one of those now. The issue comes into being, though, is when we roll out uh, the Alabama accountability list, and you have nine schools that uh, are on uh, that list. I refuse to say failing school list because they're not failing schools, and I'll share that information with you. And also, when this data is the same data that's being used for the report card grades that will come uh, out tomorrow. During the day and certainly, you know, those two o'clock hours in the morning, it crosses my mind or I think, what would our scores have been like had there not being, been any testing problems, even in light of the test not being completely aligned? So, as I said, no excuses, just to share with you those things that are of concern. In Mobile County Public Schools, we had nine schools out of 86 schools, or that's 10.4%, and that's 10.4% that 
that we review, we view as being too many, but were on the Alabama accountability list. No elementary schools on that list, four middle schools. Through the years, we have addressed middle school issues, middle school learning, and we had five high schools on the list. Let me give you a rundown on those very carefully or very quickly. Chastang Fournier Middle School was off of the list. It returned to the list uh, after one year. Uh, and there was a 2% decrease in proficiency rate. Now that, and I'll tell you some mitigating factors in that in a few minutes. Mobile County Training School had been off the list one year came back on the list, uh, there was a 3% increase in the proficiency rate. Now, Dr. Crenshaw, you're a statistician. You know a 3% increase in proficiency rate is progress. Uh, but also keep in mind, at Mobile County Training School, there's a declining enrollment. Uh, there, the enrollment at Mobile County Training is 183 students. It's 83% under capacity. That has an impact on staffing, on programs and things, but I'll show you how we address that and attempt to overcome those issues. Scarborough uh, Middle School was in the second year of, uh, uh, is now in the second year of reconstitution. We expect the scores to rise this year. Last year, uh, there were uh, a number of students from different schools that came into that school. So we really got the first year baseline data on Scarborough Middle last year. This year will be a true reflection of what happens with the scores at Scarborough Middle School. So that decrease in proficiency rate uh, is something that uh, we feel uh, we have uh, isolated to the fact of bringing different students into the school. Washington Middle School, there's been a 2% two, two decrease in proficiency rate. Again, uh, one of the issues that impacts Washington is the declining school enrollment, uh, and that's due to reclining, declining population in the uh, communities or the neighborhoods surrounding these schools. It's 58% under capacity. Let's talk about, as we said, redefining ready and that our schools are more than one test score. And there are always people that say, yeah, but if your test score is there, what are you doing to certify your grad rate? Well, let's look at Blunt High School. Blunt High School had an increase in proficiency rate of 4%, which shows progress in moving forward. Uh, Blunt High School uh, at this time has a 90% graduation rate and an 83% college and career readiness rate. So that, even though you have a, an issue with proficiency rate, your grad rate is supported by your college and career readiness rate. Now let me tell you how that's determined. The college and career readiness rate is determined by students benchmarking on a portion of the ACT or having a benchmark score on, ACE, uh, on uh, AP or IB scores, earning dual college uh, a dual enrollment credit from a college or university uh, by uh, scoring uh, on the platinum level, uh, excuse me, the silver level on the work keys test, which is a, a, a workforce uh, aptitude and uh, academic test, or enlisting in the military. So 83 of those students who are on target to graduate have met those requirements, which certainly substantiate the students being prepared to move forward. Again, there's been a decline in enrollment at Blunt. Uh, there are 932 students, and it's 32% under capacity, which presents some staffing issues which we work to overcome. LaFleur High School, there was an increase in proficiency rate there of 8%. Uh, the students uh, were uh, more uh, uh, used to taking the test, uh, the achievement test at grade 10, and uh, scored a uh, move forward 8%, which is great growth uh, in forward progress. There's an 89% graduation rate at uh, LaFleur High School right now, and a 72% college and career readiness rate 
which, uh, you know, they are continuing to work on with students earning those college and career readiness credentials. I, I would also point out, and I, I failed to on blunt, but let me point it out on LaFleur. The students at LaFleur High School last year earned $8.2 million in scholarships. At Blunt, they earned $4.2 million in scholarships. Now, let me say that's just the, that's a, we track that. Uh, those are academic scholarships. Those are JROTC military scholarships. Those are fine arts scholarships and athletic scholarships. Rain High School had an increase in proficiency rate of 2% with an 89% grad rate and a 95% college and career readiness rate. They earned scholarships of $3.1 million and the enrollment there is 788. There still remain 28% under capacity, but with the Signature Academy programs, there has been um, an increase in capacity. They were 38% under capacity so students are moving in to being part of that aviation and aeronautics uh, program. So that's an effect of the Signature Academy program. Viger High School, there was an in increase in proficiency rate of 3%. Uh, the graduation rate, 83% at Viger High School, and a 99% college and career readiness credential. You know, that's our signature academy of advanced technology. The students there earned $2.9 million in scholarship. Now, you'll note a declining enrollment there. The enrollment is 630. It's 61% under capacity, but a school that's moving forward and making progress. Williamson High School, which was reconfigured uh, into a 12 school, they had a 2% uh, proficiency rate. Their graduation rate is 82% with their college and career readiness at that time of, at this time of 78%. And with 500 students in uh, the high school uh, with approximately 100 uh, students who graduated, they earned $1.9 million in scholarship. So you see our students are more than one test score. We want to demonstrate what our students are doing uh, in academic uh, measures. You know, teachers grade and give tests and we report out every quarter uh, uh, classroom scores, classroom grades, teacher made, uh, on teacher made assignments and scores. We give end of quarter tests that are graded. We do program assessments, whether that's a, a technology program that's in the school or using Scantron, we monitor progress. Uh, students have grade point averages. There are IB scores, ACT scores, SAT scores, and also work key scores that need to be taken into consideration. Graduation rate, college and career readiness rates, certified workforce credentials that students can leave school, go and into employment after high school and have the credentials in hand. Our students have internships uh, that they work on uh, you know, not only during the year, we have 802 students who are in our co-op program right now, and then summer internships. We have two, 12 students right now who have been in an internship program at Austell. Our students all go through uh, one, if not more, interviews to provide, to prepare them to interview for jobs after high school or also for college entrance. All of our students are involved in extracurricular activities and community service, and then we monitor attendance very closely. We want to report all of that out. Now, with all of that said, I want to share some of the challenges, and I want to emphasize to everyone in this room, these are not excuses. This is the reality that we work with each and every day. We're fortunate we have a large school system that has a lot of resources and a lot of programs. We have 7,300 employees that focus on these targeted goals each day. 
One of the issues I've pointed out, there's a con declining population in areas of the city of Mobile and also in the city of Pritchard. Uh, people are moving out, and if you've noticed, there is a lot of development on the outskirts of the city. I call the rim of the city. Apartment complexes, uh, multi-income housing complexes, uh, everything that has has continued to move to the rim of the city. Um, then you say, well, how does that really affect? Well, when you have lower enrollment in schools, the state bases the teacher allocation on the number of students that's in, a, in schools on uh, the 20th day after Labor Day. So that is where the majority of funding comes for our schools. If there's a lower enrollment in schools, you get a lower number of teachers, and then that limits the diversity sometimes of extracurricular programs that you have. We compensate for that. Staffing is an issue. Uh, you have schools that are more difficult to staff. Uh, when you see schools on failing list and graded, then that doesn't attract teachers in as readily um, because they too see those grades. You have those people that are in those schools who are truly working hard and are dedicated. So we need to take that into account. Uh, additional services are needed. Everybody wants to sort of gloss over or not look at an undermining factor of poverty. Poverty doesn't limit what people can do but it does require additional resources. And what I would point out, and there's a 70 cent poverty rate uh, in our schools based on students who uh, qualify for free and reduced lunch. That just means that we need to focus more and target funding for those schools. In the schools that are listed as the Alabama Accountability Schools, 77% of those families receive direct services. That means that the community organizations and the federal uh, subsidies were working together to make sure there's adequate housing, uh, food, uh, basic necessities in life for those families. And that equates in by federal standards to those schools functioning with a 100% poverty rate, which we have to address. In Mobile County, we have 6,582 homeless students. 11.62% of our students are homeless. We have five social workers. Uh, again, if you look at certain areas, the homelessness is concentrated more in specific areas. We have a transient rate across Mobile County of 50, 15%. That's not people being, being transients, that's people moving. Uh, moving from school to school and also moving in and out of the district. Uh, when you move into a school, you have to adjust to being there. The school staff has to meet your needs. They have to learn your needs. They have to pick up and move on. So that's a challenge. In Mobile County, we very proud that we have the best special education services, I feel like, in the state of the Alabama and the most diverse. Uh, we have 7,750 students who are served, and that's not counting gifted students. These are students with special needs that we serve, 14% of our students, and 99.4% of those students take the annual assessments. We have out of those 7,000 students, 458 that take what's called the AAA. It's more of a developmental test because these are students with very serious multi-handicaps, but those scores also come in. We embrace and we work with our special ed students every day. We have great schools, uh, programs in every school as well as Augusta Evans that services students from north to south to east to west and also our regional school. Another thing that we're very proud of in the Mobile County Public Schools but also we have to provide and meet the challenge, we are a very diverse school district and we're very proud of that. It's one of our strengths. 
Uh, along with our students, we have 2,783 students who receive, who are from homes that are considered, that English is considered as the second language, ESL students. Out of those 2,783 students that some type of services are provided, 1,241 of those students are directly served in that we are in the process of helping them learn and apply the English language in the educational setting on the, their grade level as determined by age, not by uh, the uh, uh, learning ability. We have students who enter our schools who come in who've never had the advantage of attending a school. Uh, we call them pre-literate. They've never had the advantage of learning to read and write their own languages. Uh, or those students who come in who have never had any experience with English. So we work with those. Imagine we have 51 languages spoken each day. Our students that English is the primary language and could speak it in our schools every day. Mental health. Mental health is an issue throughout the state of Alabama and something that we provide services for in many different ways. We have mental health counselors through Alta Point that work in our schools on a daily basis. We refer students to residential facilities. Uh, that could be uh, mental health issues. It could be uh, drug uh, issues that are alcohol issues that we refer students to. Um, but we get those services for those students and they're all, all included in our population. Health services, we see, serve thousands of students every day. We have over 90 nurses in our school. We have 300 students that require direct nursing services. When I say that, those are students who are on respirators, who are on, have feeding tubes, who must uh, be uh, catheterized, who have very serious problems with seizures, diabetes uh, that has to be checked four times a day. I could go on with that. These students are students that we have to uh, address those challenges and move them forward. There's crime in the surrounding communities. Uh, there's crime throughout the United States of America and in throughout the state. We are a slice of the communities we serve. Uh, and we, we work with that. Many times that is on the news that, you know, we have incidences that, are, that occur. We are a city of 56,000 students, 7,300 7, employees, but we are a slice. I tell people all of the time, we don't issue guns and we don't sell drugs on our campuses, but we work to educate our students that that's not what they should do. We have a code of conduct. We react immediately. We have a security division that's second to none that addresses those problems throughout Mobile County. But that's some of the realities. Also, we don't want to go without saying funding is always a critical issue. Uh, people aren't aware that the funding from the state level has not returned to the level that it, we were at in 2007-8 before the Great Recession. The state legislature has made great strides as the economy has recovered to, you know, raising what we're getting through state funding, but we still have deficits there. And imagine you're operating your home or meeting your family's needs on the budget you had in 2007, in 2018. We're moving forward, but that's still an issue. We've also had a decline as recently as last year in local revenue. Um, our property tax and sales tax determine uh, the portion of funds that we get locally. Property tax was impacted because we've had uh, people, uh, industry, that had uh, property reappraisals uh, that uh, impacted the sales tax revenue that came into the school system. But I want to say, in order to address those challenges, we also do budget. We recognize that we have to provide extra services. We do it on a daily basis. The schools that are on the failing list, just to use them as an example, 
above state allocation this year, and that's assistant principals, that's counselors, that's additional um, uh, teachers in the classroom to meet those needs, particularly in smaller schools where you need teachers to teach all of the core content areas uh, and academy specialists uh, out of local funds. We've invested $2,523,000. We have $9,000 in school improvement funds that have just come in that are being allocated to these schools to provide additional support. That's teachers, materials, equipment, intervention, before and after school programs, text, test prep, as well as wraparound services uh, that the students need with counseling and other services. We've increased the Title I allocations. We get a, a, a certain uh, amount of money in each what year for Title I. What we did this year, we uh, those schools that did not have as great a poverty rate, and some of you had those schools in your district, they did not receive Title I funds this year because we reallocated the funds to provide a greater amount of funds to the schools on uh, who who had greater amount of uh, greater amount of students on um, free and reduced lunch. Um, the nine schools that are on the list received two million one hundred seventy one thousand and fifteen dollars. Now understand this is not per school. This is a collective amount, but an amount to put programs in place. Parenting funds, it's important that we reach out to parents and involve them. Uh, $33,182 went to those uh, nine schools for parenting programs. The schools wrote grants, each one of the schools, to ask for additional money to provide teacher training. There was training provided throughout the district on addressing the needs of, of students who uh, may be in poverty situations, and that's throughout the county in all 86 schools. But these t schools asked for additional funds. They were allotted $51,573 for teacher training program. So overall, an additional investment above and beyond what the state allocated was uh, invested to address the needs and the progress showed, and the progress is going to show this year with increased achievement, but $5,678,700 uh, dollars. Also, what we have done in these schools, particularly we're concerned uh, about focusing in on our high schools, uh, we employed uh, a, a, a principal, a successful principal in Mobile County Public Schools who also came first to Mobile as an Alabama State Department of Education uh, intervention specialist uh, to be in the five high schools providing assistance, monitoring progress, working with teachers, principals, and staff on a daily basis. Uh, you'll know that person is Mrs. D.H. Walton, who is working tirelessly in those schools. We also have designated assistant superintendents, central office personnel, uh, staff that's there for services and support. Uh, I haven't entered those uh, figures into the, the, the cost of what we're doing to bring about changes in those schools. And also the Alabama State Department of education uh, comes in and monitors and looks at the schools and works with us on it. So that covers the Alabama accountability schools. Now that brings us to tomorrow throughout the state of Alabama, uh, the report card grades are going to be released. Uh, we, they are embargoed. I can't go into the schools today, but I also want to urge caution. I want to go back and, and have everybody keep in mind what we've said about the Aspire test. The grades on the report card are almost entirely from the Aspire. I also want to you, everyone to remember that the alignment to state standards was questioned that we're in the process of changing the test, and that up until November the 20th, the format of what is going to come out tomorrow as a prototype report card was not known in the schools or the school systems. Uh, there are measures 
that have changed on that report card. It was the first time the grading scale had been set and chronic absenteeism was added as a measure. Schools had been working also on the other format on local school indicators and program reviews that they would have been graded on. Uh, we received a memo yesterday that explained that those were not used on the prototype because they couldn't disaggregate the scores on that. Not faulting anyone. I'm just saying we all need to be cautious. When we look at this prototype, we need to accept it as a prototype, not brand, grade, and sort schools and students or make major decisions about programs based on these scores. Um, so the prototype report card will come out. Now let me say this, the prototype report card uh, Parents and community members overall know their schools. They believe in their schools. They don't react to these because they're in their schools every day. The thing I want to, uh, uh, to urge people, know your schools, be in your schools, see what's taking place there, and understand, again, redefining ready calls on us to not grade on one test score. You've heard me say this, and I write it to you often, that every minute of every day in all 86 of our schools in Mobile County, something great is happening because our schools own their program, they're dedicated to their students. Each school has its own environment, its own culture, it, uh, its own goals, and it has its own challenges as well as its own success stories. After 46 years in education, I can say we're not on the right path using one score. I understand and I've heard people say that they're doing this in the best interest of transparency. Well, let's be totally transparent and use multiple measures. Now, uh, you know, I will share with you that tomorrow we will have, and, and our scores are not a surprise. Uh, we just didn't know how the grades would fall out. Uh, have you ever taken a college course and you couldn't track your scores and you didn't exactly know what letter grade you were working toward? Well, that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've had the data since the 17th of July and working on it. But tomorrow, what you will see is Mobile County Public Schools fall into a bell curve. That's what we'll share today. Next slide. Um, that bell curve for Mobile County looks like this. Uh, we will have 29% uh, low performers, low performing schools, 42% average performing schools, and 29% high performing schools. Generally you think of what you see in a bell curve is uh, 23, 54, 23. Do we have work to do? Yes, we have work to do. But this is an overall view of what you'll see. There'll be A's, there'll be F's, but keep in mind this is based almost entirely on one test score. When you see the scores tomorrow, dig deeper and look at the percentages. A lot of them are 67, 68, 69. Maybe if there had been points for the indicator or maybe those bonus points on attendance that schools had worked so hard on, they may have been moved up a letter grade. Those are the what ifs you think about I do my thinking when I wake up at two o'clock in the morning, or maybe it's worrying. I don't know. But that's what you'll see you t tomorrow when the scores come out on uh, this uh, prototype report card. I'm asking all of our schools and uh, to give really viable information. I think that there are people at the State Department who want that information to improve the reporting process. We certainly are working with uh, other school systems to get the information out about redefining ready. But as I said, 
we do have room for improvement. We're working on it. You're seeing what we're doing. We're committed and we're going to continue to work on that. What Mobile County is going to do in order to demonstrate uh, what we have there, and that print's awfully small on that, but we're going to do a dashboard or a report card on all 86 of our schools. We have an ambitious goal to have that in place by the 26th of February. I'll let you know at the board meeting when that will be released, and we will get that information out. It will include all of our indicators, grad rate, uh, student engagement rate, uh, courses offered, attendance, the attendance rate that, student, that schools have worked on. Uh, I didn't point out on that chronic attendance that's on this report card. It includes those uh, 300 students that we have that are on respirators, diabetes, severe asthma, uh, tube feeding and all. It, it included all of those students. It was just a number of days, excused absences. That's got to be refined, and I think the state recognizes that. But we'll give you that report. I want to say to you that I think that the state of Alabama is on a, a mission to offer school choice and options. We embrace that in Mobile County. Remember the Alabama Accountability, the School State Reporting Act of 2012, the Alabama Accountability Act of 2013, and then I would add to that that there was the Alabama School Choice and Opportunity Act of 2015, which opened, um, which was for uh, established a charter school commission in charter schools. What I have said and I'll continue to say, and it. It may be, you know, my parting message or my sermon uh, is that in Mobile County, we have very viable school options. We have a good education system that involves school choices. We have quality public schools, private schools, parochial schools, and now we have a public charter school. There's choice for everyone. What we've got to guard against is finding fault and not working together as on that education system. We have a problem in Mobile of not promoting what we have, but rather looking at the glass being half empty or three quarters empty than full. I would say in Mobile County, we've known school choice was important. We know our families. We know education. We know the climate for education in the state and in the nation. We have multiple school choice options. Uh, you know, schools of innovation. And let me say, we've been a leader in pre-K. That's an emphasis in Alabama and in the nation. We've had pre-K, just four has been in existence for 28 years. Uh, we joined the Alabama first class uh, uh, pre-K initiative, uh, and we have um, pre-K classes, 59 located in schools and at just four, <clears throat> and we have blended pre-K classes to give our students an opportunity uh, with uh, school students with special needs and regular needs to move forward and to work together. Eight magnet schools, we increased that one magnet school last year. We have blue ribbon schools, we have lighthouse blue ribbon schools. We have class banner schools of distinction, very proud right now. We have three uh, who will be recognized uh, next uh, uh, week or two weeks from now in Montgomery. Uh, these are schools that have innovative and distinguished programs. We have special needs schools I mentioned. We opened Fondy as a year-round school. Our Signature Academies, which is uh, one of the finest programs in uh, the state of Alabama. We have business education and higher ed partners <coughs> that are involved in that. The schools develop those pro programs based on community needs. We have early college, dual enrollment. We have Envision Virtual School, career technical education that's second to none, evening education option program, overaged, undercredited students. We have Pathway Academies. We recognize that we have students who are not 
functioning well because of behavior issues in our reg regular school setting. We opened an elementary, a middle, and a high school program this year that are working very successfully. And we have a junior ROTC program that is outstanding. School choice, Mobile County Public Schools. Quality programs, Mobile County Public Schools. Large school system that can offer these advantages. A school system established in 1836 that's been able to develop these programs working together. We have multiple pathways. Uh, of course, I always have to show pictures of what's happening in our schools, but where we emphasize preparation uh, that we're going to graduate prepared students for success in life. Now, the last page, it really sums it up to what I, you know, I want to impart. Redefining Ready is saying that students, and this is a national program, the students will be college ready, career ready, and life ready. It takes people working together to do this. Pre-K-12 administrators and faculties, board and central office, parents and students, business industry and higher education, elected officials, community organizations, and community members. My message, and this is being live streamed today, and I hope people will see it, that throughout the state of Alabama and also in Mobile County, we need to work collaboratively to, yes, improve education, to make sure our students are getting the very best and progress is being made. We need to make sure that everyone is working together. And that's what I've got to stress, that we promote what we're doing, not pull it apart, not pull public education apart, but that we recognize there's a place for everyone. And at the end of a 46-year career, I've told people uh, my crystal ball is very cloudy with public education. I believe in the institution. There's a place for us all, and we need to work on that because public education is the foundation of our society in America. Whatever form it takes, whatever option that it chose, chooses, it is. Do, is there value in private and parochial? Yes. Every family deserves the opportunity to select a school and a program their children are in. We want to offer that, but we need that foundation to continue to move forward. I would urge people to be very cautious about this idea of sorting and grading and then funneling funds into that when we have a program that is working. Uh, I appreciate your attention today. That was what I asked you to come in for this meeting today to hear. Um, you've, uh, you know, Dr. Foster, that concludes the presentation. Thank you so much, Ms. Peek. I would ask that the, uh, if the board has specific questions of Ms. Peek, that you put those in a, uh, in an email to her so that, uh, or jot those down and leave them with somebody to get to her. If there's any uh, quick comment that any of the board members would like to make on any of this, and I'll, I'll start with Mr. Stringfellow, is there? Not at this time, sir, but I appreciate all the information to speak. Dr. Crenshaw?